welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, like I mentioned, uh, part of our Easter month is that we're starting a series on Sunday nights called He Lives. We're going to be examining what it means to us today that Jesus Christ lives. Not, not just knowledge of what happened in the past that he raised from, from the dead. And, 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 you know, if that was the end of the story, uh, you know, what are we doing here? And so we're going to find out as we go through the word of God, we're going to find out through this series what the life of Jesus Christ today means for us here in the church, here in the 20th century. And so before we get to that, we need to pray. Amen? Because I need God, definitely. But listen, you need God too. And we don't go to church to hear from a man or a woman, the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, the tall, the short, any other type of personality or any of that sort of thing. We go to church to hear from God. So stand your feet, would you? I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord in prayer. If you have your Bible, get your Bible, hold it in your hand, and let's honor the Lord tonight. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're just thankful tonight for the life of our King Jesus. We're glad that he didn't stay dead, he didn't stay in the grave, but he lives. Lord, tonight, reveal that to us, what that means for each and every one of our individual lives, God. God, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for that. Lord, tonight as we open up your word, we pray that you open us up to receive it, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand. Lord, we'll do our part, give interest and attention. God, you do your part, and we know you will, Lord. You're faithful and you're good, God. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, give us the guidance, the wisdom, the vision, the direction, the encouragement, the strength, the correction, and even the discipline, Lord, we'll thank you for that too, God, as we see what it is that you have for us tonight, God. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves, also we would ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord, and at no time do we see ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we give you the praise and the glory and honor. We thank you that you bless them as you would bless us this night. Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. And as you have a seat, open up your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter number 13. We're going to start out in 2 Corinthians chapter number 13, and we'll launch out from there. And tonight, this is He Lives, part number one. And it's going to be a three-part series as we head towards uh, Easter weekend. But really, we're celebrating Easter all month long, and we're starting tonight in 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verse number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 4 says this. It says, for though he, notice the capital H speaking of Jesus. It says, for though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Tonight, as we look at the word of God, I I, want to just examine some of the things about this verse because it's a power-packed verse. And when you get a hold of one little truth in your life, oftentimes it's not the, the paragraphs or the, or the long, drawn-out thoughts or those sorts of things that change our lives. Most of the time when we approach the Word of God, it's one little thing, one little principle, one little word, one little scripture, one little phrase, one little thought, that as we get a hold of it, it will literally change our lives and change the world that we live in. Tonight, as we approach the Word of God, there's a phrase I want you to see there in the Word in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 4. Look at what it says once again, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 4. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives. See, Jesus Christ was crucified, yes, and yet he lives. Jesus Christ had died, and yet he lives. Jesus Christ had lived a long, full, not a, a full life, I'm sorry, not a long life, but a full life here on the earth. Some scholars believe around 33 years. And and, and in that short time he was on the earth, he impacted the world, but then he went to a cross. And as he hung on that cross, he gave up his spirit and he died, and they put him in the grave. And yet, as we see in the verse tonight, he lives. He lives. He didn't stay in the grave. He didn't stay dead. Death could not hold him. The devil couldn't stop him. See, our our, our sin couldn't even keep him down. Why? Because he has the power of God working on his behalf. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. See, nothing like this in history had ever happened before. 
Yes, there were others who were raised from the dead. You remember that uh, there, there was the, the prophet in the Old Testament, Elijah, and he went and, and he raised the, the widow's son, right? He, he raised up that, that boy. And, and, and we find out that there were people that were raised up in the Old Testament that had died, and yet they lived. Remember, the prophet's bones were there in the grave, and what happened, there were some guys that were digging out, and they were getting ready to put this guy in, and all of a sudden, a band of raiders came out. And what do they do? They throw the dead man in to the prophet's grave because they had to defend themselves, and there they are fighting, and, and all of a sudden, here comes their friend who was dead up next to them. That would have tripped me out. I don't know about you. I, I, I would have been kind of scared at that point. Like, what are you doing? Didn't we just... But, but what happened here was totally different. See, it wasn't the power of another. It was Jesus Christ alone, dead, in a tomb. And what happened was, was that the Spirit of God raised him up. See, even though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives. He lives. How does he live? He lives by the power of God. And then it says, for we also are weak in him. What does that mean? See, when we live our lives and when we go in Christ Jesus, that old man has to die. That old man has to be put away. That old man has to be buried in the grave. And when we come out, we come out a new man, just like Jesus Christ. No longer the old man. See, that old stuff has passed away. Now I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Oftentimes I see this as the, as the reason why when you examine Christians and you, when you take a look at the life of people who come to church that may call themselves a Christians, there's a marked difference between those that are saved and unsaved, yes, but also those Christians, true genuine Christians that if we died we would go to heaven. But there is a marked difference between the true Christians that are living the new life of Jesus Christ and the ones who are still operating according to the old life, to the old man. You see this time and time again in the lives of people. A lot of times people say, well, the church is filled with hypocrites. Well, what I believe is that, yes, there may be some that are hypocrites, but also there may be some that don't realize what it means that he lives. See, because he lives, now all of a sudden it changes my life. Because he lives, it changes my perspective. Because he lives, it changes the way that I get direction, get wisdom. It changes the way that I respond to the world around me. It changes the way that I approach every new day. It changes the way that I approach marriage. It changes the way that I raise my kids. It changes the way that I do finances. It changes the way that I do relationships. It changes the way that I speak to my neighbor. It changes the way that I, I conduct myself in the marketplace and amongst people that are outside of the church. See, because he lives, now all of a sudden, I have a new life, I have a new perspective perspective, and I really live in a new reality. I live in the life of Jesus Christ. And so tonight, I'm going to put a statement up, he lives. And we'll complete this statement a couple of times tonight and see what it means that because Jesus Christ lives, because he lives, yet he lives. But what does that mean to us today? Are you guys ready for this tonight? All right, praise God. First thing, he lives, number one, so we can enjoy real life. Yeah, a lot of people enjoy in life, but the Bible tells us that the pleasure of sin is passing. See, we could get discouraged as Christians when we look at the world and we say, man, they're, they're out there making money, and, and, and yet, you know, my pursuits take me away from that, and I know that, that God doesn't want us to pursue riches. He wants us to pursue his kingdom first, and then he'll add to us all that other stuff. See, God wants to bless and prosper your life and doesn't want you to feel bad about having wealth, but at the same time, he doesn't want wealth to have you. And see, we could get discouraged looking out because sometimes in order for wealth not to have us, there's a sacrifice. There's, there's something that we have to do called giving. There's something that the Bible wants us to do called sharing. And where we could have stored up and we could have had more, now God is telling us to deny ourselves. And we say, we say well, if I didn't have to do that, I could have this. See, they're enjoying all that stuff out there in the world. But yet God says, I don't want you to enjoy that life. I want you to enjoy real life. Sometimes when we look at people out there in the world and they're just enjoying, you know, getting drunk and going to the clubs and dancing and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes I, I hear people, especially uh, when I was working with young adults, young people oftentimes would say, man, I had so much fun out there in the world. I used to dance. We used to go out at night. We used to be crazy. We used to do all this stuff. And it's almost like you hear people talking about sin and the way that they once lived as the glory days. Like the best is not yet to come. The best is behind me. And I guess I'll do this if this gets me to heaven. And yet God never intended us to live a life where the glory days is sin, and where, where the greatest stuff is behind us. No, God says your best adventures, the greatest exploits, the most that you're ever going to do, the craziest stuff that you could be doing and could be plotting and planning. Listen, God's got a better plan. God's got a better life. God's got a better thing ahead of you. 
Why? Because he lives. See, who could think up, who could manufacture Jesus Christ going to a cross, beaten, bloody, ripped to pieces, spit upon, mocked and scorned, put in a grave, and in three days he would rise? Who could conceive that? Who could think that all by himself, without anybody touching him, without anybody speaking a word over him, without anybody opening up the grave, that he would come alive, that he would come out of the grave clothes, that the stone would be rolled away, that an angel would be kicking back, sitting there, waiting for everybody to show up? Who could have thought that up? Only a God who wants us to enjoy a real life. The Bible tells us God's given us richly all things to enjoy. God wants you to not just live a broke down, busted, and disgusted life. God wants us to live a God life, a life that's adventurous, a life that we can't wait to get out of bed, a, a, a life where we look forward to the future and, and not hang our heads down in despair, but no, lift up your heads, Jesus said. I mean, sometimes you talk about the end times with people and it's almost like they're scared. You know, they're looking at the end times and I don't know what's going to happen and the world's going to collapse and things are going to fall in on itself and the worst is yet. Listen, yeah, all that stuff's going to happen, but listen, in the middle of that, there's going to be Christians doing great exploits. There's going to be Christians saving souls. There's going to be Christians prospering. There's going to be Christians out there on a mission one yard from the gates of hell saving souls, pulling people out of the fire. We can enjoy real life. We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 14, that the avenue of Jesus' death was a cross. If we could put that verse back up on the overhead, 2 Corinthians 13, 4. Notice it says, for though he was crucified, how? In weakness. Now, that's the New King James Version. It says, in weakness. I looked up this word in. I was just thinking about this. He was crucified in weakness. Does that mean that Jesus was weak? Well, we see Jesus, he did miracles, he did signs, he did wonders. Jesus didn't, uh, 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 Jesus wasn't taken to the cross. No, Jesus went to the cross. It's quite a difference. And, and Jesus wasn't weak, he was meek. He was submitted to the will of his Father and went willingly to the cross. See, that shows me that there was strength. So when I saw this in weakness, I thought, that can't be. How could it be? that he was crucified in weakness. And yet, when we, I looked at this little word in, it really talked about from a place of, from a point of, from something that was springing forth. See, it was a starting point. It was a, it was a place. Jesus emptied himself of the glory of the Father. Jesus came, veiled in flesh, as a man, submitted himself to the weakness of the flesh, submitted himself to feeling and touching and having to eat and and, and, and the things here, natural feelings, emotions. That's why you find Jesus laughing. That's why you find Jesus weeping. That's why you find Jesus talking. That's why you find Jesus angered. That's why you find Jesus going after people and wanting to put his hands and bless the children. That's why you see Jesus wanting to teach and wanting to take time and wanting to relax and sit back and allowing people to lean back on him. See, Jesus submitted himself, and from that place of weakness, he was crucified. The real word is better understood in the older translation. If you have an old King James Version, it really says he was crucified through weakness. Or launching from that point of weakness, he was crucified. His crucifixion sprang forth from a place of weakness, but his life springs forth from the power of God. You read 2 Corinthians 13, 4, says, For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives, how? By the power of God. So his life springs forth from... Or it starts at, or it begins, the, the new life starts at the power of God. And by the end of the verse, we see that the life we live springs forth from the same power of God as well. Notice the end of the verse, it says, for we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him. How? By springing forth from starting at the power of God toward you. And that's what this is about tonight. So what does it mean to live? See, it'd be one thing to just say, live and enjoy life. But what, is, what does it really mean to live? I was thinking about this, and I looked it up, and most of the time we think of to live as to breathe, to be among the living, not lifeless or not dead. We say, oh, if you're not dead, you're alive. You know, and sometimes we get that, that sort of philosophy, that mentality. I've heard some people say, well, any day above ground is a good day, you know, as long as I'm not dead. And, and, and I get that. I understand that. That's okay. Well, let's, let's go beyond that surface level understanding of life. That is not living. Breathing is not living. Existing is not living. Yes, in the natural, in the basic sense, sure, I'll give you that. But what is the life that God wants us to live? Well, when we look at the biblical usage, it means to enjoy real life, to have a true life worthy of the name. See, there's a name 
that God has given us that name of Jesus. And as we live a real life for him, now we're living worthy of his name. Active, blessed, endless in the kingdom of God. Having vital power in itself and exerting the same upon the soul. To be full of vigor. To be fresh. To be strong. To be efficient. To be active. To be powerful. See, that's the life that we see in the Bible. When you start to study out this life, you find out. I found this word. You guys ready for this? This is a $20 word. I spent a lot on this word tonight. It's one of those good words that you may have heard before, but you never knew what it was or you thought it was a curse word. But I'm going to say it, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad. I'm not swearing. But the word is efficacious. See, you're looking at me like I was looking at the dictionary, reading this. And I said, what is that? Listen to this. Listen to this. I love this. I love this. Successful in producing a desired result. That's the kind of life God wants us to live. Not a life that's a failure. Not a life that doesn't produce the desired result. See, God wants us to live a life in Christ. Why? Because Christ's life was effective. Christ's life produced the desired result. Jesus said, I always do the will of God. I always do the things that God tells me to do. I only speak what I hear. I only do what I see. And his life was effective. Things happened. When Jesus came on the scene, the scene changed. And when Jesus died, death couldn't even hold him. Death itself had to submit to Jesus Christ, and death itself now changed. Death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Why? Because he lives. He was effective, and now that life, God has placed it on the inside of us, Jesus in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory, and now our lives can be effective for the kingdom of God to the glory of God. Wow. That means God isn't interested in you having a broken, pitiful life. He wants us to enjoy real life. Real life is only found in Christ. Christ is still dead and not raised again. Like Paul said, we are to be the most pity of men. Why? Because we have no hope. We've got no purpose. What are we doing? Why would we sacrifice? Why would we give? Why would we love? Why would we go out of our way? Why would we suffer if there wasn't a resurrection? If Jesus wasn't at the right hand of God waiting for us, preparing a place for us? John 10, 10, very familiar verse. You can turn there if you like or I'll put it up on the overhead. It says the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. See, the devil is interested in defeating you. The devil's interested in depleting you. And the devil's interested in deleting you. See, the devil wants to come to steal, deplete, kill, defeat, and destroy, delete. He doesn't even want you to have a legacy on the earth. And yet, look at the rest of the verse. I have come. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus said his life is lived. Why? That they may have life. The God kind of life. Real life. But not just life, not just breath, not just existing, that they may have life and that they may have it. How? Oh, come on, you guys. I'm preaching way better than you're responding right now. How can they have that life? How can they have that life? More abundantly. See, that's a life that's overflowing. That's a life where there's no lack. That's a life where there's supply. That's a life that is full. That is a life that is effective for the kingdom of God. Many doctors and nutritionists are trying to add years to your life, but God wants to add life to your years. Are you listening tonight? Maybe you've heard of the missionary Jim Elliott, one of my heroes in the faith. 29 years old. Didn't live a long life. Listen to what he said. He said, I seek not a long life, but a full one like you, Lord Jesus. Said that. Wrote it in his diary. He went out to the Aqua Indians there in Ecuador. And he was martyred as he was trying to share the love of Jesus. But his life wasn't ineffective just because he died. His life was so effective that his wife and the wives of the other men who went with him that were also martyred went in and loved these people to life. Loved these people, told them about Jesus. And now the very people who murdered their husbands are living for the Lord telling other people about Jesus. And the whole tribe knows the name of Jesus Christ. That's the God kind of life. Whether how long or how short you have on this earth, it doesn't matter. God wants you to live an abundant life, a full life, a life of Christ. Second thing, 
he lives. First one is so that we can have a, enjoy a real life. Second thing, he lives. Number two, so we can follow him. See, Jesus asked us, yes, to follow him to the cross. He said, anybody who comes after me must take up his cross and die, right? But Jesus didn't ask us just to stop there. Jesus also wants to, us to follow him into life, that we would live that resurrection life that he lives now. Jesus wants us to follow him to the cross so that we can also follow him in the resurrection. That means die to yourself every day. That means that you put the flesh under. That means that you're not living for yourself any longer. No, now you're living to Christ. Love what it says in Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. Galatians chapter 2. Let's turn there together. Galatians chapter 2. In verse number 20, it says this. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. See, he says, I I I I've died. There's no more old man. That old man, that old rascal, he's dead. A and now the life that I live in the flesh. See, we, we, we understand that the day we said yes to Jesus and we asked Jesus into our heart, we didn't naturally die and fall over dead. Any more than when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, they physically died. No, it was a spiritual thing that happened. So when we said yes to Jesus and we received Jesus into our heart, we asked him into our heart and life, made him our Lord and Savior, now that old man died spiritually and we have been born again. And now the life that we live in the flesh, we live how? By faith in the Son of God who loved us and who gave himself for us. Wednesday night, Pastor Deborah taught a message about the favor of God. And she talked about the ark that Noah went into. I don't know, anybody here Wednesday night, you caught, I mean, if you didn't get a hold of that, you need to go to CD Counter like pronto tonight after church, okay, and, and get a hold of that. But what she started to talk about was how Noah went onto the ark, and the ark was not a boat that had a rudder that could turn and, and, and guide you in a direction. You could not, on the ark, plot a course and, and have any sort of sail or any power or any rudder to steer yourself to get into a direction. All you could do was float. And, and, and afterwards, Pastor Jim was mentioning, and, and I myself personally have been meditating on this, just change your life when you start to think about that. Why? Because if you died and you've gone into that box, right? A dead man goes into the box, right? So here's Noah. He, he builds this ark and then he goes into the box. And now he has no way of steering his own life. He's got to trust God. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Noah could not make his own direction, could not plot his own course. He had to trust that God was going to land him in the right place at the right time and that him, his family, and all the animals he was taking care of would be okay. In the same way we, as we die to self, see, sometimes we want to, we want to steer our life. We want to have a hold of that rudder. We want to plot a course. In fact, we've already plotted the course. Many of us, I know myself, yes, control freak. I want to plot my course. I want to tell God, God, this is how it's going to be. God, here's the steps we're going to take. God, this is the outcome. And God says, oh, no, I didn't place you on an ark with a rudder. You look in the Bible, the only rudder you have is your tongue. That's another message. When we enter the life of God, we now follow his direction for our life. In other words, we are allowing the Spirit of God to move us, to give us direction, to do what God has called us to do. Romans chapter 6, great, great section of Scripture. Romans chapter number 6, talking about that old man's dead, and now we're living the new life in Christ, taking our direction from him. Romans chapter 6, we're going to read verse number 4 through verse number 9. Romans chapter 6, verse number 4 through verse number 9. Take a look at what it says with me together. Romans chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. See, we died. The old man went to the box. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk or live out our lives, how? In newness of life. So just as Jesus went to the grave, we go to the grave. But just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so also we are raised from the dead. 
So the question is, why are we living like the old man? Question I've often asked myself. Why? Because we're not living in newness of life. We're not allowing the life of God to be lived through us. Why? Because we are doing our own direction, our own thing, rather than God's direction and God's thing. Verse number five, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Why he lives, so we live. Verse number six, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. See, we used to be slaves of sin. We used to take our direction from sin. We used to be in bondage. We used to be weighed down. We used to be chained to this thing called sin. We couldn't get away from it. We had to obey it. We were slaves to sin. But look at this, verse number seven, for he who died has been freed from sin. See, no longer does a slave serve a master that he's dead. Doesn't matter how much that master goes to a dead slave, slaps him in the face, takes out a gun, puts it to his head, that dead man can't respond, right? See, and that's how we as Christians have to live to sin, is that we got to put ourselves back in the box. we got to be dead. I no longer take direction from you, sin. Why? You're not my master anymore because I died. I do not respond to you anymore. So when that temptation comes up, no matter how tasty it is, a dead man's not going to eat. Why? Because he's dead. Plain and simple. No matter how great the assault comes against that dead man, he's not going to move. He could be in the middle of a war, and he's not going to flinch. Why? Because he's dead. We've been freed from sin if we died with Christ. Verse number eight, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse number nine, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. In the same way, no longer has dominion over us. We should not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Why? Because we died to that. We're done with that. It's over. Now we have to not respond to sin, but we have to respond to God. We no longer live to sin, but we live with Christ. The life that we live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God. He lives so that we can follow him, number two. Third thing for today, last thing that we're going to take a look at for tonight. He lives, number three, so we can hope. So we can hope. You know, without the resurrection, there's no hope. That's evidenced by the disciples. Think about the disciples for a moment. Standing there watching their Savior be taken, bound, beat watching Jesus be put on trial and wondering, wait a second, wait a second, if he's the Messiah, I thought Messiah was supposed to come and take over. I thought Messiah was supposed to be this great military leader who, who freed the Jews from the oppression of the Roman government. I thought Messiah would come and set up his reign on the earth as king and, and we would reign with him forever. I, I, that's my picture of Messiah. So here is their one who they have professed, all of them have said, we believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And now their Christ, their one who they had preconceived notions of, here he is getting beat up. Here he is with Roman guards punching him in the face and ripping out his beard and spitting on him. Here he is with the leaders of the Jews, the ones who should be bowing down and honoring him as their king, spitting at him and mocking him, laughing him to scorn. And so the disciples, I can imagine, were very troubled, wondering had they just wasted three years of their life following this man. Oftentimes in our lives, I think we go through these crises of faith when we, when we take a look at what we're doing and, and we get our eyes off of Jesus and we get our eyes onto our natural situation. We say, what are we doing? Why am I doing this? Why am I striving so much? Why am I sacrificing? Why am I giving? Why am I serving? Why am I taking time? Why am I putting effort into this? It doesn't seem to be working. And yet we have to remember to keep our eyes on Jesus. Why? Because he lives. And the fact that he lives gives us hope. He lives so we can hope. See, the disciples, before Jesus was resurrected, they were walking around, they were crying, bawling and squalling. I mean, Peter even went back to the old man stuff. Remember that? He said, I'm going fishing. What did the other disciples say? No, Peter, Jesus said he was going to be raised again in three days. Didn't you hear him? He said, let this sink into your head. I'm going to go and be abused and go to a cross and die. But don't worry. You know, Jesus said all that to them. He told them what was going to happen beforehand. 
This should not have been a surprise to these guys. And yet, here they are in despair. And rather than say, Peter, you're crazy, man. Don't go. We need to wait for Jesus to come back. They say, we're going with you. And so what happens? Jesus comes, and he's raised from the dead. Mary sees him, has an encounter with Jesus, thinks he's the gardener. You know the story. Jesus sends her back. No, I'm not the gardener. It's me. It's rabbi, teacher, right? She's all excited. Why? Because now there's hope. Because he's not dead, he lives. And so she runs back to tell the disciples. The disciples, Peter and John, come running, right? They have a race. John comes up, outruns Peter, takes a look, bows down, looks into the grave, doesn't see anything. Peter, Peter's Peter, man. He's not going to stop at the edge of the grave. He goes running in, right? He's going to investigate and see what's going on. Now, all of a sudden, there's hope. Now, all of a sudden, there's something going on. Now, all of a sudden, there's life. Something's happening. They follow Jesus, and now they're realizing that it's no longer in vain. No, he lives, and now something great is going to happen. Amen. Same thing in our life. When we get our eyes off of Jesus, we'll get in despair. We'll get depressed. We'll get discouraged. Things won't be happening. But listen, when you have hope, it doesn't matter what's going on around you. It doesn't matter the present circumstances. Because your eyes aren't on the present pain. No, your eyes are on the prize, the upward call of Jesus Christ. He lives. He's not in my past. He's not dead. No, he's alive, and he's in my future. He's in my present. He's here and now. He's in the midst of this with me, and I have hope. See, where you're at today is not where you're going to be tomorrow. Where you're at tomorrow is not going to be where you're at next week or next month or next year. See, God is not finished with any of us yet. And the very fact that he lives means that we can have hope for every new day. Hope keeps you going. Hope gets you going on. Hope is the blueprint for faith to go to work on. Hope keeps you tough in tough times. Hope gives you vision through the fog. So you may not know the direction, and yet if you have Jesus Christ, you've got that hope. doesn't matter that you can't see around you. All you know is Jesus Christ is alive, and he's got me. He's He's, he's given me direction. I may be on an ark without a rudder, but he's going to take me where I need to be. Don't know how it's going to work? He'll make it work. Last scripture for tonight. 1 Peter chapter 1. Go there with me. Last verse for tonight. You guys still doing okay? Praise God. 1 Peter chapter 1. And I would encourage you, if you feel discouraged and you feel like you have no hope, you need to read 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3, all the way down through verse number 12. But I'm going to read just one of those verses tonight. But I don't know who that's for. Somebody tonight, you feel discouraged. You feel like you have no hope. You need to dig into this section of Scripture. Because just by reading it and meditating on it, read it, read it several times. Read it several days over and over again until it gets deep down on the inside of you. Confess it over your life. Speak it over yourself. Tell yourself, this is me. This is what's happening in my life. God's going to encourage you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. Take a look at what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. You know what that means? It means you were born once, but then you died, and now you're born again. So he has begotten us again to a living hope. He has begotten us again. We've been born again to a living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What's that mean? That means because he lives, he is our hope. And it is a living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's not futile hope. We don't hope as the world hopes. Oh, I, I hope so. I hope maybe it's going to happen. Maybe someday in the sweet by and by. Well, you know, when I fly away and meet him up in the sky. No, that's not the type of hope we're talking about. We're talking about a confident expectation that because Jesus is alive, it secures every promise of God for my life. And now my hope is in him. I can expect him. I can go to work with him. I can believe him. I have faith in him. I receive everything that he has for me. And now, doesn't matter what the present holds, your future is bright because he lives. What did we learn tonight? What did we learn tonight? Three things. We learned number one. He lives so that we can enjoy real life. Second thing we learned for tonight is that he lives so we can follow him. And final thing that we learned for tonight is he lives so we can hope. You got something from the word of the Lord tonight. Come on, give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. Hey, before I let you guys go tonight, a couple more things we're going to do. I want to just take a moment of your time and talk to you. I want to talk to you about your eternal life. It's one thing to come into the house of God and have a good time like we did and sing songs and enjoy. 
beautiful painting like that. Get into the word of God. You guys were great tonight, by the way. Thank you for allowing me to speak that into your lives. I really believe you, do, you did get something from the word tonight. Let's not stop there. Let's make sure that before you leave this place that you really do have the life of God. That you really are born again like we saw. Remember, we, we saw that term that we had to die and be born again. A lot of times people don't know what being born again really means. Sometimes people think that if you're born again, that just means you're a good person. You do a lot of good throughout your lifetime. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible to say that being good gets you into heaven? It doesn't work like that. You can't be good enough to get to heaven. And so being born again doesn't just mean being good and then you get to go to heaven, be with Jesus, have eternal life. There's going to be a lot of good people in hell. And tonight I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it to heaven just by being good. In fact, the Bible says the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And our good works compared to God's goodness are like filthy rags to God. Not going to make it. You're going to be thrown out. So tonight, let's make sure that you, if you died, that you would go to heaven and not hell. Sometimes people think that being born again means, you know, being raised in church. Oh, I was raised in church, you know. Attended church as a child. Parents raised me in church, told me you were Christians. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child. Maybe they took you to religious classes like Sabbath school or Sunday school or catechism class. And, and they had you baptized or christened as a child. And, and, and you were born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven denying hell, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible say that you're raised in church. Parents tell you you're Christian. That makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, that makes you a Christian headed for heaven denying hell. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're born in America or that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. Nowhere. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor, you know, I, I think being born again and, and being a Christian headed for heaven really means that, uh, you know, um, that not only when you were a child did you go to church, but, you know, I'm sitting in church tonight, sitting here in front of you tonight, and that's, that's what makes me a Christian. That's, that I go to church now. That's, that's why I'm born again, because I, I attend church. So that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're born again, headed for heaven, denying hell because you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. It's not there. That's like saying I could go down to my garage, sit in my garage in my house, Call myself a car, and that makes me a car. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't matter how long I sit there, or even if I make honking noises, I'm not a car. I'm not going to make it to heaven. Be born again just because you sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people think, ah, but, but I, 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 at my last church I got involved. I helped out. I sang in the choir, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader, even taught in the Bible classes, and got a membership card to that church. That's great. Glad you did those things. But could you just show that to me in the Bible where that gets you to heaven? Church involvement. Get you born again. It doesn't work like that. No one in the Bible say helping out, carrying the pastor's Bible, making decisions, people thinking of you as a leader. You teach in the Bible classes or you get a membership card that God is waiting for your membership card at the gates of heaven before you can enter. It doesn't work like that. Come on tonight. Let's love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You say, but wait a second. I know God. I, I mean, someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I, I celebrate Easter and the resurrection every year of my life, sing the songs at Christmas. I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian born again because I know God? Well, the problem with that thinking is if you'd read your Bible, you know that the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. If you'd read your Bible, you would know that the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's not a Christian headed for heaven, even though he can quote scriptures. You read that in your Bible. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven and denying hell. This is not what this is about. But rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. And when Jesus was speaking about this very subject on how to get into heaven... How to enter into eternal life. He was talking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good guy. Did a lot of good deeds. Raised in his church called the synagogue. Eventually got involved and became one of the leaders. Celebrated all the holidays. He memorized scripture. He could quote the scripture. We would have thought if anybody knew God, it would be Nicodemus because he was a teacher in Israel. 
told other people about spiritual things. And yet when Jesus comes and talks to this great man of Israel by the name of Nicodemus, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, you got it all going on. Keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, you must be born again. That tells me that being good, church attendance, getting involved, knowing who God is in your head, none of that is born again. So what does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's that simple. Have you given God all of your heart and all of your life? If not, then I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not saved. You're not going to make it. Why? Because you're not born again. And tonight I'm going to give you an opportunity to be born again. And this is all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Revelation, last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What is he saying, though? Lukewarm, what's all that about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and then, and occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything, and you're not opposed to God but you're not wholehearted for God? Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity just like this. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. One, two, three, bang. Just like that. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang. That's your opportunity to give God all of your heart, to give God all of your life. All you got to do is simply raise your hand and acknowledge your need for Jesus, just like this. I'll see your hand up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. People will see me. Uh-huh. But get over that embarrassment. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up. He says, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. He said, but if you deny me, I will deny you. No one wants Jesus to deny them. Why? Because that means eternal life in hell, away from God forever and ever. So tonight, come on, push past that embarrassment. Get your hand up if you know you need to do this and get right with God in this safe and friendly place. Listen, we're all rooting for you. We're all excited for you. We all did this at one point or another, somehow or another. And listen, we want you to do this. No one's judging you. No one's criticizing you. No one's condemning you. You say, but pastor, I feel like you're pushing me. Yes, I am. Why? Because the devil's pushing you into hell. And listen, I'm just loving you enough right now to get aggressive with you and get in your face a bit and let you know that you need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. Hey, it doesn't matter if you're embarrassed. Even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. But you can do that in a safe and friendly place. Probably won't even be embarrassed. Come on. You can do this tonight. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this? Never given God all your heart and life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? Well, if you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart. You need to get right with God. You can do that by simply raising your hand in a moment. All across this auditorium, back in the family room, wherever you're at, if you're watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online tonight, come on. You can get right with God by simply raising your hand. God sees right where you're at. Then if you're on campus, you can either tell an usher or come into the church service right afterwards. If you're online, click the blue button that says respond to God. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high right now. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you guys. Who else got those guys over there? Two wise people tonight already. Two, three. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? You know you need to give God all of your heart. You know you need to give God all of your life. There's three wise people. Where are you at? Come on. Be bold tonight. Don't wait. He lives for you. And he wants you to live in him. If that's you, you haven't yet given God all your heart and life, and you know it tonight. Come on. Just pop your hand up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else real quick? Come on, come on, come on. I know there's more than three. You need to do this. If that's you, anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Thank you, number four. God bless you. Who else tonight? I didn't embarrass them. Won't embarrass you. Come on, come on. Just pop it up. Pop it up. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Five wise people already. Anybody else? Come on. Your heart's pounding out of your chest. You're saying, man, God's just tugging at my heart. Come on, let's respond to God right now. Anybody else real quick? Best decision of your life right here. You won't regret it. 
Anybody else? Anybody else? There's five wise people already. I want to give you one more opportunity. Last call. Last call. If you're sitting there saying, if he gives one more call, I'll do it. Hey, here's your one more call. God just called you out. Come on. Your last call. When I'm looking in your direction, just pop it up. Who else tonight? If that's you, you know you need to do this. There's five wise people already. You won't be alone. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick, real quick, real quick. Pop it up. All right, well, let's give the Lord a praise for five wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, all five of you, or if you should have raised your hand but you didn't, it's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, a Bible, a friend if you need a friend. And I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because tonight we're going to change destinies. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved when you invite Jesus into your heart. We want to do that with you, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So let's all stand and welcome them. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now from the foyer. If you heard that, you raise your hand. Come on in. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. No one leave. Let them come right now. Come on, come on, come on. Lord, I give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. And I'll live you can come for too. You alone. Every breath that I take. And every moment I From the family rooms, so you can bring your kids if you need to. Come on down. They'll remember this. Lord, come on down. All right, there's still coming. Come on, there's still room for you. You can come too. I'll give you my soul. I'll live for you. All right, well, thank God you guys have come. Everybody's kind of huddled over here. That's cool. Don't worry. Listen, we're not going to beat you up or anything like that. Just take a breath, okay? It's cool. Put a smile on your face. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. All right, you came to give God all of your heart. Came to give God all of your life. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you right over here in the black jacket. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? You know, you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, this is about as weird as you're going to encounter tonight. He's cool. He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance so that you're not wondering or worried. First thing he's going to do is lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff. Everybody loves free stuff. We love giving away free stuff. We've got a couple little booklets our pastors wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God, okay? It's easy reading, taking maybe a half hour if you read it slow. Listen, you invest more time in the movies, television, books, conversation with friends, texting, all that kind of stuff. You can invest a half hour, sit down, find out what to do next in your walk with God. Final thing he's gonna do, he's gonna give you what we call a spiritual personal trainer. Basically, let me explain it to you like this. A, a spiritual personal trainer or an SPT, like we call them, is a friend in church. So we give away friends here at The Rock. That's, that's just how we roll, all right? And, and, and we, a friend is somebody who will encourage you, someone who will call, come alongside you. And an SPT is that friend who will come alongside you and encourage you to help find out what to do next in your walk with God so that you get strong in the ways of the Lord. Don't go back to the old man. Listen, you're leaving that old man. He's going to the box, right? Now you're going to get your direction from God. And so you need to find out how to do that. I'll teach you five things for five weeks out of the Bible that will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. At the end of that five weeks, you're going to have a healthy habit of coming to church, and you're going to be so blessed. Now, listen, I'm going to make a promise to you guys, okay? Here's the promise. Give us a year of your life here at the church, here at the Rock Church, sitting under the teaching here at the Rock, getting direction from God's Word. Why? Because at the end of that year, God will give that year and for the rest of your life so blessed that you just will say, I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way, let's give him a hand as they go.